Welcome to the Interesting Podcast with Jedi Brian, number 13. This week's guest is John Smith of Major Props. Now, John has been a friend of mine for, I want to say, a little over a year. Um, we met through a mutual friend and uh, hit it off right away. John is um, one of the coolest dudes that I've met and also one of the most intelligent. He's a great person to talk to. And uh, in this episode, we talk about a ton of stuff. Uh, he's worked in television. He was on. He worked on The Glades and Burn Notice. He's also worked in indie film. Uh, we talk about that. We talk about how he built a Dalek around a wheelchair, which if you haven't seen pictures, you, you need to look them up. They're way, way cool. Um, we also get into the fact that he forged a bullet-resistant Captain America shield. That is awesome. Uh, so apart from being, you know, a great prop maker, a very cool dude, he's also a great cosplayer. Um, he's done Loki, he's done The Fourth Doctor. Uh, my personal favorite of his is he's done um, Jeremy Brent's Sherlock Holmes, which is actually my favorite version of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but John's a really, really cool dude, and in this episode, it's very, very informative in the sense that he breaks down a lot of stuff like melting down certain kinds of metals to... Uh, stuff that he's worked with as far as materials go and future projects that he's uh, got in the works, which I think uh, you'll find pretty interesting. Uh, but John's a great dude. Check him out uh, online. Check out Major Props. Uh, if you ever need a prop commissioned, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, but anyway, here we go. I hope you guys enjoy uh, the interesting podcast with Jedi Brian, episode 13 with John Smith. Roll the theme song. To do, um, I used to do audio recording for films. I worked in, oh, really? Uh, I've worked on Glades. I've worked on Burn Notice. I've worked on the Miami what? Vice movie. I've worked in Magic City. Um, I worked in Tyler Perry's uh, something or other when I was in Georgia. So I've worked what? in quite a few things. How'd you do all that? Uh, well, I used to pursue acting. I pursued uh, filmography. Nice. I wanted to be a, um, what did they call him? Uh, I haven't done it in a while. A, sim a cinematographer. Okay. So um, I wanted to be a DP and, you know, basically shoot film originally i wanted to be a director but then everybody wants to be a director so you're like uh yeah i'll find something else i was in a movie and now i will never want to be a director <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um the knowing the the fact that you have to know everything like if somebody's like blue or red you have to have an answer well or they'll like dethrone you <laughs> i feel like a director has to know everything about every possible job and a lot yes. of the directors that i've personally worked with do not Oh. And every time that I've worked with them, they're usually very difficult and they're bumbling and the production goes slow and everybody goes over time. Ah. And we have to do five takes of the same shot that should not have been a you know more than two take shot. Right. And it just it lags. And then Magic City was the primary example of that, I would say, because they, they did, I'm not joking, 17 retakes for a crane shot <laughs> with a... Um, he was a comedian of some sort. He used uh, dummies, kind of like... Um, uh, Jeff Dunham. Okay. So he was a ventriloquist, and uh, he had this red-headed dummy, and he was supposed to walk into this big ballroom. Magic City takes place in the 50s, and it's supposed to be like a okay. casino area. So we're all the party guests in the casino, and we're the extras. Of course, we get the short end of the stick because, you know, we're doing all that fun work. Oh, yeah. And then um, we have to keep smoking cigars or drinking the same bottle of wine every take because... Oh, I hear you. Yeah, it's a reshoot. We, so. uh, in, in the movie I was in, there's a scene where me and the main actor, because I, I played his best friend, so I was one of the leads, and we had to eat pizza. And oh, oh. dear God. At first, I was really hungry, so I was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah, take, I just like, keep eating 15, pizza. Oh, it's disgusting. You're like crying. Like, I don't want pizza anymore. <laughs> I never want to eat pizza again. It's awful. They, they say that, uh, I don't know if that's true, but they say that um, Peter Quill, um, oh, God, what's his name? Uh, Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt 
every time that he would do a food take, they they normally just spit it out, but he'd just keep eating it. Oh, really? Yeah. So well, he, I can imagine with his like workout regimen, he's probably starving. All yeah. The time. So he was one of those people who like anytime he, but this was for Parks and Rec, so every time he'd oh, okay. eat something, and he, he would just yeah, <laughs> he would just keep eating it. He's like, all right, keep it coming. That's, so that's what, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, I just I. There's some people who have a food tolerance, and then us mortals are just like, oh, I don't want to ever yeah, see food again. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I like the film industry. I just yeah. don't know if I would want to work in it professionally. It's it, very different. I was, um, I think I can say this. If I can, I'll cut it out. <laughs> um, I was just an extra on Ballers. Oh, okay. Uh, like a week ago. It's like an HBO show with The Rock in it. Right. And, that, uh, like, more than half of the crew worked on Burn Notice as well and the Glades. So it's all like the Fort Lauderdale, Miami right. people. Right, so it's basically they the whole it, South you know? Florida crew just carried over. Yeah. And Originally, were, I had asked, cool. I thought that they had relocated to an upper state because right. when the tax incentive was cut for Florida, a, yes. lot, of ev- a lot of the film crew jumped ship here. So right. I'm noticing people are coming back. Yeah. Or the ones who never left are starting to pick up again. Sure. It's like they kind of remained stagnant or did something else. Because we still had commercials in uh, South Florida for a while. Right. We just didn't have any, like, TV shows or movies. And yeah, it's starting yeah. to pick up again. Um, I know Georgia's tax incentive is actually one of the best in the country. Yeah, Georgia's very good right now. So it's just a state up, and everybody's like, well, we'll just go state up, and we'll fake everything. So right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they avoid shooting uh, L.A., so they come to the Hollywood Hills here at the, you know, Mount Trashmore in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember when they were doing that. I was almost on, um, what do you call it, Rock of Ages. Oh, I was a PA. Nice. I was going to be a PA, but I didn't get it. Really? So, yeah, I was late. How did you get on to Bird Notice? Like, um, did you know someone? Or? Actually, they came to me. Really? Um, they Because my father worked with a lot of unusual properties. Oh, my okay. father owned a boat yard, and nice. um, it was on the Miami River by the I- Miami International Airport. It was called Bojean Boatyard. Okay. N- with Miami Vice, we had worked with them. They had filmed the entire climax of their movie on the property. Oh, nice. They built a, um, they built a very small skeleton warehouse in the middle of the property uh, and tore it down. It was for a uh, brief scene in the beginning, so they just you know, decided to reuse certain places again. Right, right. And uh, the scene was less than seven seconds long. I, I counted. <laughs> it was actually seven seconds. So I was like, okay, you spent half a billion dollars building a warehouse for seven seconds. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the industry. <laughs> yeah. And it's Michael Mann. He's one of those really, really nitpicky people when it comes to location. He's like, if it's not the place, I'm not shooting there. Sure. And having personally met Michael Mann, it's it's very... I, I don't want to say anything bad about him, but he's he's a difficult person to work with or yeah. even be in, in the presence of because he's... He's your stereotypical idea of a director who it's it's not good enough. Do it again. It has to be this or it has to be the actual location. It's everything ah. you see in film that they're mocking is it's kind of geared towards him and a few other directors. Sure. Um, but anyway, so off track a little bit. Back yeah. to uh, all I do is get off track. <laughs> exactly. It's, I feel that's going to be the entirety of this. For sure. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, the the. Uh, Burn Notice people contacted us because we had worked with Miami Vice previously. Gotcha. So okay. they, we had another property on the Miami River uh, on 7th Avenue, right where it turns into downtown Miami. Okay. So it was waterfront property. We had three tugboats stored there. And they're old-fashioned tugboats. We used to do towing for the Miami River. We would take all the freighters up down the river to the bay so they could you know, go to their different ports that they have to go to. Um, either Haiti was uh, very prominent. Some of them went to Cuba, but we weren't really not allowed to get near those because the right. cargo was considered contraband if it went off the port. Gotcha. So it, it was touchy with those particular ships. Like everybody, anytime you had a uh, a Cuban bound ship, everybody back up and were like, ah, oh boy. Right. They so, figure it out, I guess. Yeah. Because th- they had they had customs come down there so many times. I'm sure. And there was so many incidents I, I could count in the time that I lived there, and I just remember it's like, oh, uh, somebody somebody messed up again. Right. <laughs> so, anyways, back to the track. So they they wanted to film on that property, so they contacted my father. Right. And my dad brought me in because I was trying to pursue filmmaking. Okay. So he showed me around, and then the director for that particular episode said, hey. You want to be a PA? My, uh, your dad tells me that you uh, you want to work on film. I'm like, oh yeah, I'd love to be. What? So they gave me a PA position temporarily. Right. I got to sign the form and all that. They signed a release form. I got paid. I got nice. paid like four hundred dollars by the end of the the episode. Dude. 
I forget exactly what episode. It was uh, season five or four episode. Gotcha. And towards that, uh, I got to work in Glades as a PA because Dude. I had the experience. So once you have experience, you get to get a foot in with the door oh, yes, for everybody so. else. And because those crews actually know each other, they swap each other out back and forth. Yes. So they were all like, yeah, no, just they recommend you to the next guy. And he's like, okay, you're cool with them. You're cool with me. So That's the way to go. That's what they yeah, always tell you. Once you get in, then you get to talk, then you get passed around. Exactly. Once getting in, that's the hardest part. Once you once you make one foot in the door and they like you and they see that you're not gonna you know screw up their production. Yeah. Then they'll be like, all right, you're cool, tag right. along. We call you the slave labor hand. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I I was mostly in charge of fetching water for everybody or moving the s- the sea stands and all that fun that's stuff. That's uh, PA work. Yeah. <laughs> and then. I've done independent films, but there was one in particular that stands out in my mind. Yeah. Um, it's actually been getting a lot of a lot of uh, notability recently in all across the um, really independent film world. It's called Three Thirteen. Okay. Uh, it's a homeless uh, awareness movie. Oh, it was okay. filmed entirely in downtown Miami. We shot for a total of ninety three days. Good lord. In two thousand twelve, and we shot in downtown Miami. There was no other location, so we had permits for every possible street or avenue. Nice. In downtown. Right. So we could basically just set up wherever we want. We had special cones that we put out. Anytime cops showed up, they like, you have a permit? He's like, look at the cones. They're like, All right. And they walk away. Nice. This is like we, we own the city. It was, it was amazing. Well, anyways, it was a Winnebago was our, our mode of transportation. Oh, nice. <laughs> so um, the guy was wealthy. He had just spent all of his money on a Red Epic, which at the time was the Good hot camera. Good Lord, yeah. Like the Red Epic in 2012 was the oh camera of choice. I can't even imagine yeah, 2012 he shooting. He spent 55 k on it. That sounds about right. <laughs> so, And that's just the body. We're yeah, not talking about the iced lenses that he got. Cards or lenses or anything. No, but he got Zeiss lenses. Those are the oh, the prime ones, Lord. Zeiss Prime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he went for the he went for it. So Wow. He he had a winery in Argentina, so he had money to spare. He, it sense. wasn't like he was broke. He was doing yeah. it because he was bored. <laughs> so he wasn't nice. in it for the money. He was in it to just to do something nice. Right. right. I, he's not he's not a bad guy. He's difficult to work with, but sure. he had his heart in the right place because you know, we we did use a lot of stories from actual recorded incidents with homeless people okay and the main protagonist throughout the film is based off of one event in particular that happened in 1990 during a recession in south florida okay so a lot of people just lost their jobs and this one follows particularly a homeless man who you know lost his family his wife left him took a kid and all of his friends abandoned him so you know he's going through his life living day to day and in miami people don't care about the homeless they treat them like they're scum or they're, they're less than that and you know, it was trying to show you that you shouldn't look at a human being as anything less than what they are. They're a human being. Just because they're homeless or they're digging through the trash trying to find food, that's that's even less of a reason to, to discriminate against them. Absolutely. And that's exactly what this film was trying to scream. And right. we had one of the best casts uh, because the independent actor was actually really well known. His name was Paul Gerrere. Okay. And he did a very good job. He was, he was able to capture the emotion. He brought it together. Uh, our crew was also independent. We all came from Miami Dade. Okay. So it was a bunch of college graduates, but they were good college graduates. They weren't your stereotypical, you know, I right, just, like I just graduated. I want to make a movie kind of people. They yeah. were, I don't think I'm ready to make a movie, but let's take a crack at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all got along for the most part, except for our, uh, our AD. We hated our AD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we originally had one AD, right. and she got fired for some sort of silly misunderstanding. So then we had a new AD who was brought in. And this guy was the epitome of snobby, I'm better than you, and I'm doing nothing. Uh, like, the, he, um, he would AD. tell you how to do your job, but he doesn't even know what your job is. Right, right. He he took more into his title than anything yeah. else. You're an actor, but I, I'm the assistant director. Come on. My, my position was the, uh, I was gaffer and key grip. So Sweet. Sweet. At one point, I was promoted. I was head of all grips. We had nice. seven grips, so I was. I had a team of seven people. We had to set up quite an extensive. We had one case, five case. We had Fresnels. We had everything. Nice. We had the whole light setup. We actually rented it uh, from a. I forget the name of the company actually, but it was one that a lot of the film productions in South Florida would go to. Like it was a professional okay. one. So yeah, they would actually rent out equipment. That. Yeah, they, they had, we ha- we actually brought. <laughs> Okay, that brings me to an interesting story. You mentioned kilo lights. Yeah, yeah. So we were filming on the Metro. We got a permit to film on the top platform for a Metro on Coconut wow. Grove. So we're there, and 
we had to we had to regulate traffic for the metro rail, which that's that's a big deal. It's a huge deal. <laughs> yeah. So we have lights set up all over the platform, and it's windy, and we're up high, and we had a Fresnel no. and the kilos over in the corner, and the kilo fell down into the metro rail track as a train was coming. Oh. And the no. reason it's so funny is because all the cast members and all the uh, the uh, crew remember was one of the uh, the assistant assistant ads screaming the kilo <laughs> because the, right as it fell everything just went slow motion. We no. uh, I have to describe it. It's um if you ever seen a fluorescent bulb in the uh, a ceiling light in an office, it's those long tube like balls for those yes. of you who aren't aware, and they're incredibly fragile. So they they take any shock. They explode. Done they just it. go pop. Yeah. And, of course, they've got mercury and other poisonous gases mixed in between, so you don't want to be breathing that in. It's yeah. An isolated area. Stay away from that. But off topic. So the funniest thing, though, the train stopped in time. Really? And the tracks are electrified, so it's not like any of us could jump down there and get it. Right. The train conductor ended up bringing us back the light, but the most amazing thing was the light was unharmed. All four what? like bulbs were still going. What? Yeah. And it, it fell, fell a good 10 feet. The most fragile bulbs in existence fell 10 feet. And survived. That's a, mi- that's a miracle yeah. in and of itself. <laughs> and we, we were thinking about the cost of replacing them because those particular ones were, um, they were tungsten lights because we had to swap out between incandescent and tungsten all the time. Right, right. Dude. So, uh, the... Uh, I think the tungsten bulbs cost a lot more. They were uh, they were made specifically for that type of light. Sure. And, um, and they're they, they, too. they have different color temperatures, which is important depending on what you want your film to look like. Yes. And we're shooting with a red epic, so it doesn't really matter what we're using. It's <laughs> got to look it's got to look like sex. It yeah. just looks good for all sure. the way through. We had some professional court. We had a we had a jib, a nice one. What? And to put a red epic on the end of a jib, that's not an easy feat cuz the, no. the camera weighs almost like 30 pounds. It's massive. Yeah. And then it uses a C mount, so which is uh, they're very s- they're picky mounts because they don't they don't latch onto everything. You can't just pick a tripod and go, I'm gonna put this camera on a tripod. No, yeah. no, you're not. <laughs> it's not gonna fit. That's a different type of mount. Oh, well, I'm gonna put it on the uh, on the slidey thing. No, you're not. Right. That's that's a different mount too. What can I put on? You hold it. You hold it. That's exactly right. Your hands. And if you drop it, <laughs> you're dead. There was actually a person whose whole job throughout the production for the 93 days was to stand near it when it was not in use. Oh he would just man. sit there, put his hand on it, and then wait for everybody to finish what they were doing. They'd come get the camera. He'd stand in the corner. When they'd take it off something, they'd put it there. He'd hold it. And then <laughs> he'd go back to doing whatever he was doing afterwards. That's he also awesome. did Slate very badly. Oh. But, nice. you know, whatever. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you know. I mean, film's fun because I like it. It's an adventure, and it uses every art that you can conceive yes. in one to tell a story. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't they don't realize that. It's like everybody thinks, oh, the director's in charge of the movie. Nah, not it's, really. No, it's kind of, the director is like the curator of everybody else making the movie. Exactly. It's, it's, it's sort nuts. of like, um, it, you get the person who's, I don't think any one person controls a movie. And maybe it's, so it's <laughs> the producers. If, if it was, it's the producer. The <laughs> yeah. producer's putting out the money. He's going to be like, I want it like this. Yeah, and they can be dicks. So, yeah, it's it's it fun because you get to go out and you go on an adventure. You go around the city. You're shooting movies and stuff. Yeah, and you're it, making it, a movie. It, I think every kid at one point thought to himself with a camcorder, let me make a movie. It's going to be fun. Let's go get my friends who will tell a story. Right. And absolutely. I think it's one of our core beliefs it, when we're young growing up is we all want to tell stories. Absolutely. And I think that's also what George Lucas represented when he was young. He wasn't really trying to make a movie. He wanted to tell a story. Exactly. Even he, like up until – like I, I read an article, I think it was yesterday actually, where he was talking about the next trilogy and why he's completely detached from Star Wars now. Right. I, I, I saw the same article. Yeah, I didn't get when, to read it though. The whole thing he was like because I'm telling a story. And Disney wanted to make something more fan servicey. He's like, we want to make something for the fans. He goes, I want to tell the story. This is what happened. It's about fathers and sons and grandchildren. He's like, this is a sto-. He's like, I'm making a soap opera. It's not about spaceships. They just happen to be there. That, I mean, that's, you got to respect him for that. I mean, oh, absolutely. I, 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 I've never been like a big fan of George Lucas's work. Yeah. I mean, I like Star Wars, right. but I don't know if I actually like George Lucas for Star Wars. Gotcha. It, okay. It's in between because a lot of. A lot of what he wanted to do was contrary to what I feel Star Wars is. Gotcha. Even though okay. he's the person who created it, right. it was 
a lot of the producers, because he did produce the next two, but he didn't direct yes. them. Correct. So he only did Hope, and then after that, Empire was directed by... Um, Irvin Kirshner. Yes. And, and then, then Richard Marquand did yeah. six. And he had some creative control in that, but ultimately it, it was kind of falling to other people's creative yes. that's, vision. That, that's what I was talking to somebody about that recently. My my biggest fear for Seven. I think Seven's going to be phenomenal. I, I have the same fear I feel you're yeah, going to say. I, I, what I... Four, five, and six. Three different directors, but they all feel the same. Right. You know what I mean? One, two, and three feel the same because it's George Lucas. You know, it's all exactly. there. I don't want... I love J.J. Abrams. I don't want Abrams Star Wars. I just want the next Star Wars. I, I, I know what you, you know? mean. I'm excited for this Star Wars because I've seen Star Trek. Yeah, okay, now this is taboo to say Star Trek and Star Wars in the same conversation. No, but I loved the new movies. The thing, though, was the reason J.J. Abrams took on the Star Trek projects in the first place was because he had such a, you know, he was a big fan. Star Wars was his first movie that made him want to say, I want to be a filmmaker. Exactly. And he said, well, Star Trek is as close as I'm ever going to get. Might right. as well take it. And, and then they offer him the position. He's like, oh, yeah. well, I guess I should have well, thought about that. Right, yeah. So I, that, that, I feel like it's going to be good because he, he the way he puts his Star Trek is like classical music and Star Wars is hard rock. Right. And when he redid Star Trek, it was definitely hard rock. Oh, for sure. For so sure. I, I definitely have faith that the vibe will be there. Same. I'm worried about what points the story will take because I'm not going to lie. Whenever you take something that's already ended and Star Wars ended already in terms of like where it was at six. It sure. ended in the 80s. So we're we're past that point. 30 if years you, past it, too. And if you try and take it and say we're doing another one, it almost feels like it feels like a uh, fan fiction. Yeah, Almost. It, it definitely could end up that way. I, and um, I think that's my fear for is that it's going to feel like a very big budget live action fan fiction. Yeah, it, I mean, it definitely could. It so. definitely could. I, um, on, on what you said about the Star Trek thing, I that gives me hope because he didn't like Star Trek growing up. No, he actually he was a Star was, Wars fan. Yeah, so he never he, liked Star Trek. So if he can take something he didn't even like growing up and turn it into you know Star Trek and into darkness... Which I, I loved, but I was a lot a of big people hated fan. it. I personally loved it. Same. And for anybody who's listening who doesn't like it, I, I'm sorry. I just think it was very good. Everybody's yeah, right? complained that Khan wasn't, you know, Spanish. I'm like, I'm sorry. I think I think Benedict did a very phenomenal. good job with it. The scene he embodied the character to a point where I could say that's Khan. I loved the scene when he first showed up. When he's got like a blaster in one hand and then a cannon in the other. Yeah. I, I was like, oh, snap, what is this? What I also like about it is. It's an alternate universe. You can do whatever you want. Absolutely. So you can say this is the universe where that hasn't exactly happened. Well, I was a little disappointed they didn't mention Botany Bay. Yeah. That did break my heart because they mentioned his ship adrifting in space. I'm like, say Botany Bay. Say it. Right? Just say it. <laughs> Just say the words. <laughs> and then he did. And I was like, oh, you you bastard. Right. So um, it it was definitely well done. I loved the reverse when yeah. at the end when Kirk dies. Yep. I knew it was coming the minute the music started playing all orchestral and soft i'm like oh no they're not gonna do it are they oh they're gonna do it (laughs) and then when he you know he's like i have been i always will be your friend i'm like oh i hate you all so much (laughs) it was funny i actually have a story i watched that movie so many times in theaters yeah i went to see into darkness three times separately that's awesome and i loved it It, i was because i just watched the space seed which was for Khan's first appearance right and then i watched the wrath of Khan, of course just to make up for that and then I went to go see the movie. I'm like, I'm ready. So I was a diehard Trekkie. Okay. I, I love Star Wars. I like uh, Star Trek. Sure. I feel, I feel like I know more about Star Trek than I do Star Wars because I definitely know a lot about Star Wars. Right. But I feel like I just happen to know a little bit more about Star Trek because its universe is a little less expansive. <laughs> it's our universe. Yeah. Just in the future. So I, I feel like I can, I don't know, get behind it a little bit easier. That makes sense. That so makes sense. anyways, that being said, I had... All Star Trek history at my disposal upon seeing the movie. I loved all the things that they, you know, referenced. Right. Gorn references when uh, Bone was, uh, Bones was talking about how he once, you know, had to give live birth to pregnant Gorns. I'm like, oh, they were referencing the, the most infamous of the uh, Star Trek villain things. The monsters looked so bad. It's right. the one that everybody sees uh, on, on YouTube of Kirk fighting, throwing... Uh, oh, yeah, foam yeah. boulders at yeah that lizard looking thing that's a gorn oh, okay so they're gotcha. they're making references left and right to things and I, I absolutely adored it 
That's and awesome. I think the best thing that I liked is that they left it wide open for the five-year journey, yes. which is where Star Trek starts. That's that you're uh, already on okay. the five-year journey when you're watching the show. So you're like, okay, they're just voyaging around lost space trying to find new things. It's like, that's right. cool. And the, the first two movies, we haven't even touched on that yet. We haven't found anything. And then we're getting the third one. Uh, the the one thing that I just loved in the opening of the second one was how much of an homage it paid to an episode. Oh, yeah? Like, it was basically a miniature episode in the beginning of the movie. With the, the, the guy with, and his yeah, daughter. with the volcano and everything. Yeah. I was just like, oh, that's perfect. So oh, yeah, with the, they're not even supposed to see it. And they're, like, worshipping the Enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's just, I, I love Michael Giacchino. He's the composer for the film. So every okay. time I hear the Star Trek theme, I get goosebumps. Right. And um, from what I remember, Michael Giacchino was composing Star Wars. I'm not sure who is now because then there was talks John Williams was going to do it. And then I heard that John Williams wasn't doing it. So I actually have no idea who is composing the new Star Wars. Really? Yeah. So I was excited for Michael Giacchino to co compose it because much like Abrams, Giacchino got into film score because of John Williams. So right. if there was anybody to say, you're going to make this music, it was him because he studied him. He knew sure. exactly inside and out what it was. And that was for Star Trek. Uh, yeah, he does Star Trek. So it's, gotcha. yeah, it's kind of funny They're trying to turn Star Trek into Star Wars. Yeah, right. But at the same time, it worked because Star it, Trek was boring. It didn't. Right. It was not easy for people to watch. So you take your. It's true. You take your girlfriend to go watch one of the old Star Trek movies. She's going to look at it and go. What is this? I know. Let's go watch exactly. something fun. And then we watched Into Darkness and she cried. Yeah, it's, oh my God, I have a funny story to tell. So I was mentioning I watched the movie a few times, right? All right. So, you know, next time I watched it with my brother, we went to, you know, the dollar store and we snuck in some food as, you know, all good we movie the patrons thing. should. Same thing. <laughs> so we got some classic Pepsi bottles and we brought them in. We, you know, fashion kind, you have to pop off with a bottle cap opener. Oh, nice. So, you know, we got our popcorn, we got our bottles and we're getting to the scene where Kirk dies again. Right. And I already know what's coming, and I'm, I'm getting a little teary-eyed. Sure. And I'm like, oh, I love the scene so much. And there's this guy in front of me, the chair directly in front of me. And that guy just starts laughing. No. Like, I mean, hysterically laughing out loud throughout the film. Just straight through no. Kirk's death scene. The whole death scene was nothing like, ah, 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 oh, that's so good. And I'm just no. clutching my Pepsi bottle. I'm like, I will break this over yeah. your head, sir. Pink. Yeah, so, but... <laughs> The best part was after he died, he just said, oh, he died like a bitch. I'm just like, what? Oh, I just, oh. Oh, I was about to hit him, I swear. That's awful. My restraint for, uh, you know, not wanting to go to jail that That's day like saved him. That's like otherworldly. Yeah. Oh, my God. I've I never seen somebody so dis disruptive or disrespectful for a movie. Oh, my God. It was amazing. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, the most correlated thing I can think of that's happened to me with that was I saw Sweeney Todd in oh, theaters. I just watched that recently. I'd never seen it until this year. Perfect. So you know the scene when it's a montage of him just killing people yes. and sending the bodies I down? I know exactly which and one you're like talking about. And they like crunch when they hit the ground? Yes. I saw it with uh, my best friend and a bunch of old people. Right. And I kid you not, when the body crunched, this old lady, like four rows down, thought it was the funniest thing in the world. So imagine <laughs> watching this movie, it's just gross, just blood flying, send the bodies, crunch, and just... <laughs> I mean, in retrospect, th I, I, I'm not going to lie, in my mind, it was kind of hilarious, too, just hearing the... But the music goes like with it, grandma. makes it comedical. <laughs> but yeah, the fact that it's an old lady laughing yeah. hysterically, at that that's kind of... So that's it's kind of a little twisted right there. That's my Sweeney Todd memory. I was just like this old lady just loving it, and everyone else is like, uh... <laughs> yeah, I remember... The blood looked very, uh, it looked like tomato soup in my opinion. So yes. I, I was a little bit more tolerant of it. It was like, okay, the blood looks like tomato soup. I, I will stomach this movie. Right, yeah. The, like the really gross scene where he kills uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah. And it's like really slow and disgusting. Yeah. Awful. Oh. The, I mean, I love the movie. It's a good very movie. Very dark. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I, I remember making a comment immediately afterwards. It's like, it's like Shakespeare, but in the Victorian times. It's with ve singing. very much so. The so whole, like, he kills his wife because he's I know, that was so her, fucking sad. I saw it too. The kid slits his throat. I knew, he it, bleeds on I her knew face. it was coming. When he killed her, I'm like, oh no, that was her. Yep. I know it's her. Yeah, when she's like, I know. Yep. I was like, no. I, I, it was so painful too because, like, he became what he was because of the thought that he lost her. Yep. And then he killed her, and it's like, Oh, that's that's just messed up. Oh yeah, and then the Good kid, movie, the kid slits his throat, and he's like bleeding on her I, face. At that I point, like, oh. I wanted the kid to kill him. Yeah, <laughs> I was not, I was not sympathetic at that point. Yeah, so you I was like, you know, it. and I also feel like if the kid didn't do it, he would have done it. 
Yeah. Like at that point, I I feel like it was he was too far gone. Agreed. Like the shred of humanity that he had left was seeking revenge on Snape. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For you know that, and then once he killed Snape, I feel like he was gonna off himself at that point. Yeah, probably. So I mean, it's all assumption, but I feel like the movie was headed that direction. Agreed. So. I mean, it, the, the opening starts off with him talking about how he's dead inside and stuff like that. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. you're one of those guys. Right. <laughs> but so so, uh, ha- so being into film and acting and stuff, is that what got, is that what got you into props? Um, actually, believe it or not, that is what got me into props because my father used to try and market me, market me to other companies that he was working with because he worked a lot with the TV shows okay. and the film because he had a lot of unusual things. Out of, you know, after owning a boatyard, you have every prop known to man sure. and then some right well i mean not every prop but you have a lot of unusual things that most people cannot come by sure and when you come to a new state the film companies they have to find something they either go to stone age antiques which is also down by the miami river next to miami international sure and they rent things from them or you know they find somebody who just naturally has them they hey can we use your stuff we'll pay you this money he's like yeah sure right so he was one of those guys gotcha. so every time you get a deal with one of them he would try and say, hey, my, my son does props. If you need somebody to do this or that, or you need some sort of custom thing, he would try and, you know, market me. Of course, he doesn't realize they already have their professional prop masters from L.A. who've been right, practicing yeah. this all their <laughs> lives, sculpting and casting with resin and all that stuff. So he's like, right. Dad, you, you no, know, okay, your heart's in the right place, but you, you, okay, <laughs> Major whatever. Major budgets, tons of years of experience, yeah. equipment. <laughs> they're, they're using, they're using uh, urethane. I'm using foam. I mean... It ends in Thane, but it's not the same thing. Right, it just yeah. <laughs> It's not. So, it's it's one of those. Gotcha. But, um, I mean, after he started trying to do that, I thought, you know, maybe I could get into prop making. I could start building things. Right. And I started off real slow. I built a Dalek, full-size one you get inside yeah. and operate. Yeah. I started I start slow. I slow. <laughs> the first, you know, just sort of prototype, I'll try this, is a full-size Dalek. Well, I mean, I don't usually tell people this, but I built the Dalek because I was going through a breakup. Yeah. I was just like I, I I can't I can't go through this. I need to build something. I, I need to op- occupy my mind. Like most I was seventeen. I was young. So I was like at seventeen. You built that? Yes, I <laughs> built it in two thousand eleven. So I was like, I'm gonna build a Dalek. Wow. So uh, it was actually for Halloween. It wasn't supposed to be for conventions because at the time, uh, I had never been to a convention. Nice, nice. It was. Uh, I mean, I had. I'd been to MegaCon, but it was more or less as I was a normie. Okay. I was always a normie at conventions. How was that? It was very boring. Yeah. <laughs> because y- you see all this cool stuff, and you're just like, gosh, I wish I could be a part of that. Sure. And then after you stop being a normie, you realize, oh, wait, I could be a part of that. I can be that. Right. So, I mean, no offense to anybody who just likes to dress up at conventions and walk around in normal clothes. That's that's fine if that's what you want to do. But at the time, I was like, I wanted to be the people who are cosplayers, and I didn't know you could do that. So right. it's like, I'm, I'm busy being one side of the coin when I want to be the other. Sure. So, you know. I I had been going to MegaCon like every other year for a while. Kay. I think the first time I went was in two thousand. S- it was either eight or nine. Okay. So that was my first MegaCon, and nice. I didn't really go anything else. I didn't know there was SuperCon. I didn't know there was any of these other ones down here in South Florida. Right. Um, which I find hilarious in retrospect. It's like it's in my backyard. How do I not know about <laughs> it? And it's like one of the biggest ones in Florida. <laughs> and uh, back then, conventions they were more word of mouth than anything. Like we didn't Absolutely. have them networked on Facebook like we do nowadays. Right. So it was difficult. If you heard about a con coming up, it was because somebody told you. Sure. It wasn't necessarily because of advertising. It wasn't because it was on Facebook. It wasn't because you were part of an event page or a group page or anything like that. It'd say, hey, this is coming up soon. Don't forget to go to it. Right. No, it was like, hey, come to this thing with me. We're a bunch of nerds. We go you know, dress up and do stuff, and there's celebrities and things. It's like, oh, that sounds amazing. Let's right? go. <laughs> I feel like a few years ago, this this kind of like convention style was completely different. It was more underground. Yeah. I, I'm not going to say, like, oh, it was better when it was underground. No, no, no. I like it the way it is now because now it's like, it's publicized. It's way more mainstream. Exactly, sure. and there's less. Um, I don't. I, I don't think there's actually that person who stereotypically judges people who dress up in costume. You're like, oh, you're a nerd. Right. I feel like that's that's so blatantly from a TV show. It can't exist. Right. But then I see the CW doing the advertisements for conventions, and I see them doing that same thing. I'm like. Yeah, but that's a CW. That, yeah, that's right? different. <laughs> that's that's not the same thing. That's a different world. Their so, arrow is shirtless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, no, so I made it for Halloween. And okay. I built it in 21 days, which was exactly three weeks. 
Right. So the Dalek was was kind of an on unfl on flight project, and I built it with forty dollars. And I'm not talking about what? like a tiny. It's full scale. The picture scale. I've seen. Yes. that Dalek is forty dollars. Forty dollars. It's made out of cardboard in a wheelchair. I found in the dumpster. How do you even attack a Dalek? Like, how do you start? Um, the first thing you start with is how it's going to move. Okay. If you don't know how it's going to move, you're you're really shit out of luck because. I had studied, I was at this point studying to become an engineer because that's what I would end up going to college for. Right. I have a degree in engineering. But at the time, I did not. But I feel like the Dalek, I owe everything I know about engineering to the Dalek because oh, okay. it has a lot of engineering um, Components. principles behind sure. it. Everything about it is just, it's designed to move in a certain way. There's ball joints in the front that hold the arm and the gun. The right. head is on a spindle, which goes a complete 360, and the eye stock goes up and down. How do you make something like that? That's not something that you normally have to think about. It goes around, and then the eye stock goes up. But then on top of that, lights flash. That's all one entire mechanism. Right. So it's a button on top of a handle with a center mechanism that shifts up and down with a rope attached to a pulley. So that way, when you move the handle left to right, the eye stock goes left to right. The head can spin 360. Right. When you pull down on the lever... It makes the eye stock go up and down. When you press on the button, it makes the lights flash. That's the kind of principles huh. we're talking about. Okay. And then, of course, the ball joint mechanism. We had to use. I took apart a magic eight ball. Oh, I turned nice. that into a ball, and I stuck metal piping into the arms. That's how I made the plunger. What? Actually, no. The plunger originally was a lightsaber. The old, the old ones from Toys really? R Us. You know, the ones you get in the toy store, yeah. and you'd swing them out, and you'd go and hit people the, the toy store, and they'd say, what? "Sir, your child needs to leave." Yeah. But or, sir, you're way too old for this. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. If it depends on which side of the spectrum you were on. Right. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, the lightsaber hilt was originally my plunger. Wow. Not the hilt, the blade. Yeah. And then I just took Slurpee Club, sir, Slurpee, sorry, I'm stuttering, Slurpee yeah. Cup lids, and I made hemispheres out of them. That's how I made all the bubbles, so the hemispheres that go on the skirt section of the Dalek. Really? Yeah. Those are Slurpee lids. And the, Yes. The what? neck rings, which encompass the entire neck, were made out of duct tape. It was just duct tape wrapped around so wow. much that it became thickness, and I dremeled it down to make it have a concaved curve because the rings have, like, a slant on them. Right. So then I just put whatever I used on that. I put more duct tape, if I recall. So I make the slant, and I fill it with duct tape. What? Yeah. And then the dome was the hardest thing, the head. Sure. Because it's a very specific shape. It's a very specific uh, 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 circumference. It's... It was not something I had access to. And right. I couldn't manufacture one at the time. I wasn't that good. So I kept looking. It's like, what can I find that's going to be, you know, in the shape of a Dalek's head? Right. I remember one night. It was real late. I was wandering around my house. I would just scrap things in the house. I'd be like, hey, Mom, you're not using this dish strainer, are you? Thanks, bye. <laughs> and, you know, I'd turn it into a gun or something. So I remember falling onto the floor in the back patio, collapsed in just dismay that I couldn't find something to make for the head. I was right. like, I'll never get it done. <laughs> and on the floor lay before me a cactus bowl. And this cactus bowl had been in my family's possession for God knows how long. It was made out of plastic. Yeah. It had a big crack going the, down the back. So I'm looking at it. I'm staying like I, I'm looking at it upside down because I'm all laying down on the floor looking at a cactus bowl. I'm like, it looks kind of like a Dalek head. <laughs> so I grabbed it. I dumped the cactus on the ground. My mom comes out the next day. He's like, John, why is the cactus on the floor? Ah, <laughs> uh, science. I made haste. <laughs> uh, so the head was made out of a cactus bowl that just happened to be the perfect what? circumference and size. And I just made that work. And I fixed the crack in the back and all that oh. stuff. Oh. So um, it took 21 days, $40, because I didn't really need to buy things. I made it sure. out of stuff that was in my house. Which, if you're, you know... Like a normal person who's not living with their family at the time, you're going to have to buy the things yourself. So right. I estimate the cost of a Dalek now, if I were to make one again, would be about $200, Yeah, which is still pocket That's change. That's still not bad at all for a full-size Dalek. Yeah, it's five feet tall. You get inside of it, and you know, it crazy. rolls around screams at you. Yeah, <laughs> cardboard, lightsaber blade, slurpy lids, and a cactus bowl, and you made your Dalek. Yeah. And I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. It looks amazing. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And that was your that. first one. That was my first prop. It that was 2011 crazy. for Halloween. I got it out on the streets, go trick or treating, and the rolling system did not work too well. Like the yeah. the wheelchair failed me entirely. Oh, um, so you had to Flintstone. You'd sit in the wheelchair. You you just move your feet like the Flintstones. So and, you're, um, you even get in the Dalek. Yeah. Well, I, a lot of people argued with me later 
after I learned how to do things that I should just <laughs> make it remote controlled. I'm like, no. The whole right, yeah, purpose no, of no. a Dalek I is to Dalek. get in the Dalek. The ones in the BBC are actually still operated by pilots. They don't really? use remote controls because they can't perfect the movement. They always say that an actual actor will trump the movements of a robot. So they're like, right. no, we're going to do that. It's like Kenny Baker in R2. Exactly. So, you know, they stick with having pilots in their Daleks. Even the big new ones that are all colorful, they still have pilots. Difference is they can stand up. Right. Because the new Daleks are seven feet tall. Yeah, so they're it's like, massive. <laughs> yeah, they don't look like it on screen, but they are. That's and, crazy. you know, you just stand up in them and you walk. Like a normal person is kind of amazing when you think about it. Yeah. Because if you've ever been in a regular one, you're like, I'm so cramped. And you think about standing up and just walking around with this thing. You're like, oh, that sounds like a dream. Right. <laughs> so, you know, whatever. But the the Dalek, I got it on the ground. You know, it's it's Halloween. You're going around on people's sidewalks through their lawns. Right. I don't know what I was thinking. Thinking a wheelchair with 200 pounds worth of weight on it was going to move through the grass. Yeah. <laughs> but it didn't. And when it didn't, I got stuck and then I'd have to get out of it. Move uh, it back on the sidewalk. It didn't even want to fit on the sidewalk. The wheelchair was, I don't know why, wider than the sidewalk. Because I'm thinking about that. It's like, how do you make a wheelchair yeah. wider than the sidewalk? And then expect public, you know, to be able to go down it with their, you know, transportation. So Yeah, it, really. It, it was whatever. And it was not a handicap-friendly sidewalk. <laughs> no, it was not. So, <laughs> the... Um, the Dalek was considered a failure by my father when we went to Halloween to trick or treat and it didn't move and he yo know, he's like, Oh, it doesn't move, it doesn't do this. I mean the whole day I spent feeling like absolute crap because I was like, Oh, nobody believed in me. And then, you know, my mom was said to me, he's like, Hey, you know what? It still looks like a Dalek and that's more than anybody else could do. Very and I'm like, true. you know what, that's true. It does look like a Dalek, right? so I'll give it that. <laughs> it's definitely a Dalek. So <laughs> There's no way around that. Yeah. The, the appearance is there. So that was the, that was the, the point. Is I had the skill to be able to make something look like something else. Right, absolutely. Or repurpose something. And then I just learned how to fabricate things. Fabricating is going to beat repurposing any day. Gotcha. Okay. And in terms of prop makers, if you're a prop maker who repurposes something versus one who fabricates one, you know, people are going to want to go to the fabricator because they get more customization, they get a better quality prop. Sure. Nothing against people who repurpose things. But I just feel like being able to customize something versus being able to create something from scratch. It's it's always it's 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 different. Yeah, it's, it's different. Yeah. One it didn't exist before, where otherwise you turn a base into something else. Exactly. Both are skills, but they're definitely different different ball games. Exactly. So you know, after that, you know, um, I went to SuperCon 2012. Right. I brought the Dalek there, and I was mobbed. I was dressed as Tom Baker, and my <laughs> costume was absolutely terrible. So it, it was just. Yeah, I look at pictures of it now compared to the one I do today, right. which I'm actually wearing at this very moment doing you this. You are, and it looks great. And uh, You've got the details, yes. which is the most important The only thing part. I don't have right now is the blue eyes because I didn't want to put in my contacts. It was early. My eyes were like stinging. and like, I'm not dealing with it today. I hear you. I'll have a green-eyed doctor deal with it. Yeah, right. So it's Just like, who, who's going to look at me like, your eyes are blue. This is a terrible cosplay. Exactly. They'll be like, it's a scarf. <laughs> and I'll be like, at one time, I didn't wear my contacts. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> Everything was perfect, then I dropped the It's ball. one of those things, because you get that cosplay going, and you're like, I have to have this perfect. It's, you think about it in, in, in you know, actual you know, retrospects, like, who's going to come up to me and say, those shoes aren't the right type of shoe for this character? Right. <laughs> it's like, what? Uh, what? It's okay. True. I'm the same. I'm, I'm, su I'm all about details. Everything I do is, like, I try to get every detail right, but more than half of the people that see you don't know the details. Exactly. You know, so it's like, no, that looks awesome. You're like, well, I mean... It's this always your, your, own, your, your own worst critic. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's the biggest problem. And I feel like that's not a bad thing because then you're always striving to become better, right. make it look better, and that's how you are getting to be a better cosplayer or a prop maker or whatever it is that you're aspiring to be in life. If you want to right. keep criticizing your work, I mean, obviously not in the worst way possible. If you're like, oh, I can't do anything worth a damn, then, yeah, you got some issues there. Absolutely. You need to you know, believe in yourself a little bit more. But if you say, I mean, yeah, it's good, but it could be better, there's nothing wrong with that because then you guys push yourself to make it better. Exactly. And it will be better the next time. Like, I'm going to build a Dalek again because, unfortunately, the one that I had made is no longer in my possession, so it's, I don't have a Dalek anymore. It's sad. Right. But... I want one. I, it was my favorite prop. It was my favorite thing to take around to conventions. It was like an sure. annual thing. Every time a con rolled around, I'd be like, well, time to wheel out the Dalek. Right. So it was it was the good old times. And then I don't have it anymore. So it's like, I'm missing that. I'm going to build a new one. Awesome. I know for a fact the new one is going to surpass the old one in every form capable. Everything is going to be fabricated out of fiberglass or it's going to be uh, smooth on. It's going to be 
peg plastic. It's going to be metal. It's going to be all these sorts of things. It's going to have a remote controlled wheelchair. Okay, I caved in the, the wheelchair aspect because I decided, like, yeah, Flintstoning it. No, that's not a good right, way yeah. to go. <laughs> that's just bad. Yeah, you got to have some sort of break. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's going to be far superior to the old Dalek. Sure. So that's the good thing about, you know, being your own worst critic is you keep pushing yourself to get better. Gotcha. And it's, it's, you just got to make sure you keep pushing yourself. If you, you criticize your work and you just give up. Then, it's true. Yeah, it's it's, it's true. It's you disappointing. Work I've yourself. seen that happen to many artists. I I know a lot of people who draw, and they drew quite well. They drew fast. They drew well, and they you know they would go to conventions. They try to sell their art, and a lot of people say that's good. Sometimes you get that one who's like, eh, you're no better than everybody else who's here. Right. And anybody who says that is just like, really? Yeah. Right. That's not only dick. disrespectful to the person. That's disrespectful to everybody else at the convention. Agreed. Because it's just it's not cool. But. They gave up after that, and it broke my heart. I see the same thing with cosplayers. There's a friend of mine. Yes. He's going through some cosplay issues right now because people keep saying that he's overweight or he can't do the cosplay or it just doesn't look right. And I tell him, it's like, listen, don't don't follow what people say. If you do, then you know you're never gonna be happy in what you're doing. Exactly. You gotta do what you feel. If you feel good about it, that is good enough. And he loves the game. He cosplays Snake, so you know he nice. loves cosplaying Snake. He keeps going. I, I I'll be happy about that because it's just. It's sad whenever somebody's driven to be away from what they want to do. I completely agree. And cosplay is, is, is a double-edged sword. It's one of those things where a lot of people want to say that everybody's entitled to do whatever they want with their cosplay. Sure. But at the same time, I find there's that... I, I hope you don't mind if I turn this a little bit political. No, absolutely. Because I, it's a subject that I've noticed. I mean, I've done it myself. I'm not going to lie. I, sure. I'm definitely guilty of this. And I, I apologize in advance for every time I've done it because I have, I've been that person... He'll be like, oh, your cosplay is so good. But then, you know, I look at it. I'm in the comfort of my friends. And I say, oh, it's terrible. Right. And, you know, it's it's not cool because it's just it's double edged. If you're not going to say what you feel, don't say anything. Right. And if you can't say anything, then, you know, that also makes you a little bit. Mm. Sure. I feel everybody deserves encouragement. Agreed. I completely if, agree. If they're starting out, just tell them that they just they can do it. For and sure. I see a lot of people doing this. They they talk about how they support people and how they encourage everybody with different body types or different skill levels with cosplay. Right. But then in different areas of their life, they'll I've been witness to it. They'll say, hey, this person can't cosplay worth a damn or they're too fat for this costume. And it's like, or they're too skinny. And it's like, it's, it's so hypocritical. It is. And we absolutely. become numb to it because I feel like every time we see something on Facebook, we're just so judgmental of it. Right. I feel part of it's personal, like, want. Like, we want to be that. Like, part of us is jealous or we For want sure. the attention or something like that. It's like, I can't do that, so I'll just nitpick theirs until I feel better because, like, oh, it's not that great, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and it Because I can't do a lot of things because I'm still learning myself, I'm like, I couldn't do that. That's awesome. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, you're, uh, this is one of the things I liked about you when I first <laughs> met you. I'll be honest. You're like one of the more popular people I know when it comes to this. So, <laughs> like, I, I don't know if you checked your fan page recently, but it's blowing up. Right. So, <laughs> I can't take credit for it. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's still you. So, I but try. I mean, you're humble about everything you do. Oh yes. You are very open. You're kind to everybody I've ever seen you interact with, and I like that about you. It's just you're you're what I feel people should try and work into their personality when it comes to this. Because I feel like a lot of people, they lack the humbleness when it comes to cosplay. I feel like everybody, it, in a way, it has turned into a fashion show. Absolutely. But it is, and, and it is. It can very quickly become fashion. Yeah, and yeah. for that reason, everybody gets real catty and yep. snidey, and they want to, you know, just... Then some people will try to take ownership of a character, and they're like, oh, you can't cosplay this I, because That's I another did. issue I'll talk about, because I've know. had that issue with a few characters. I've had... I cosplayed uh, a few things recently, and some people told me, it's like, hey, you can't cosplay that. Your friend so-and-so plays that. And I'm like, and um, well, you know, so-and-so gave me his blessing. Not that I needed it. Right. But that's not for you to go around telling people they can't cosplay this. Agreed. So I, like, uh, I think maybe yesterday, maybe the day before, I just posted a picture of three cabbage merchants. Huh. All the guys like, that's what I'm talking about, Team Cabbage. You know? One of the things, every time I go to Supercon, I always run into a Tom Baker yeah. or a Fourth Doctor. Sorry, I'll call him by his official title. I just call him Tom Baker because yeah, yeah. that's what he is to me. Sure. He's the man. He, I mean, he cosplayed. He, he was the doctor, but I feel like he was just dressing up. He's like, oh, wear this silly costume. Right? I'll pretend to be myself and say I'm the doctor. That's basically what he was doing. Sure. So, you know, but 
do you I, do you still do uh do you still do prop commissions? With I do. Props? Yes. Um, I currently am working with metal a lot. I, I learned how to a cast Captain aluminum. America shield. Yes, I've made a bulletproof Captain America An shield. An actually bulletproof cap shield. Yes. Talk and about that. <laughs> the bulletproof Captain America shield was interesting. So, what it is, it's not entirely fabricated by me in the sense that I didn't make the mold. That's the, it's something I did not make. Sure. The mold came from Target. I didn't buy it from Target. Really? But what it was. If you've ever been to Target and you've seen their garbage cans, they have this disc that yeah. stands up over their garbage cans. It's supported by three prongs that go straight up. Okay. And what that was, that's my shield. But not the actual ones from Target. Yeah, yeah. But their mold because they sold it because they don't use it anymore. And it wound uh. up in the possession of a friend of mine. I asked him, hey, what the hell is this? It's a big ceramic disc thing. And I'm like, what is this? And he's like, oh, that's a, it's a mold, an industrial mold for Target garbage can lids. I'm like. Really? So I took out my on-pocket tape measure. I carry one with me because uh, I, I like to look at things. I, at the time, I was still in the uh, the art of cannibalizing things and turning into something else. So I'd have to measure and be like, will this fit? Will this fit? Yeah, oh, it'll fit. Right. We're taking this. So I, I measured it. And I'm like, this looks like Captain America's shield. It had a few prongs in it that, you know, would encompass those three support rods that would hold it above the garbage can. Right. But that's part of the mold, so you know whatever. Okay. But I could modify that. I could take that out. Yeah, yeah. So I said, "How much do you want for this?" He's like, "Oh, I wasn't really gonna sell." I was like, "I want it." He's <laughs> like, "You want it? What do you want it for?" He's like, "I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna cast things." He's like, well, "You're gonna cast things in what?" I'm like, "I'm gonna cast things in metal." He's like, "You can't cast things in metal. You don't have a you don't have a forge or a uh, foundry." I'm like, "I'll make one." He's like, "All right, all right. How, how much how much are you gonna give me for it? Fifty bucks." He sold it to me for fifty bucks. Wow. It was a 200-pound ceramic mold. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah. I had to get my dad to come pick it up with his pickup truck. I was going to say, I don't even weigh that much. <laughs> yeah. I don't either. I weigh 120, so that's like that's almost twice my weight if you deduct 25 pounds. So right. it's like, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so I get it. I didn't know what the hell I was doing with it. Sure. I made the first one. I, I built a homemade uh, foundry. Wow. And I melted down aluminum. I thought, okay, I can melt aluminum. That's good. Let's try something bigger. So using the help of my dad with some cutting torches, we melted down some iron. Nice. And I said, okay, iron's definitely a heavy metal. So I'm yes. going to mix the two because I want it to be heavy and light and I want it to have bulk. Iron I didn't aluminum. know what the hell I was doing. So this is, this is, I'm going to explain how much I fucked up here because right. this is not something that you're supposed to do. Right. I mixed aluminum with iron. And anybody here who's listening who knows about metal, then you know how bad I messed up. <laughs> so I pour the aluminum in and I pour the iron in. And there are two different types of metal. Um, aluminum traditionally is light, but sure. that's because it's spun. It's used in a factory and spun into a solid shape. Okay. And that's very, very different from what I did. <laughs> when you take the metal and you melt it down, it compresses. It becomes heavy. Aluminum can be heavy. Sure. And I'll explain how heavy it can be. I used maybe 23 pounds worth of aluminum, and it comes out to 15 pounds. Good so, Lord. I mean, well, I say pounds. I mean not weight pounds. More yeah, or yeah, less. Yeah. You, you get the conversion rate. Yeah. So the overall conversion makes it weigh 15 pounds, but I'm using 27 pounds worth. And it, it also shrinks during the process. Sure. So, yeah. Anyway, so I mix the, uh, the iron, the aluminum. The iron is a type of metal that gasses off. Aluminum doesn't gas off as much, but it does to an extent. Not really. It's also not, not magnetic. Right. And iron, will st it, it creates a gas in the metal, and you're supposed to hit it with a hammer. That's why you see a blacksmith smacking it with a hammer right. after it comes out of the, f the furnace, and it's all piping hot, and you're smacking all the gas out of it. So the gases don't get trapped inside the metal when it cools and then make bubbles. Those bubbles will then expand ah. and crack because the gases try to escape. So that what they do is different temperatures. Every time the sun comes up, it gets hot. Temperature comes up. Sun goes down. It constricts. The gas constricts with it. So it's constantly expanding and constricting and eventually makes cracks naturally. Right, right. Just from the temperature change of the sun going up and down. Sure. So anyways, the first shield, iron and aluminum, weighed 25 pounds. It was 27 inches long and... It was bulletproof from 22s, nice. 22 millimeter straight, straight up bounce. Sorry, not millimeter, wow. 22 caliber. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we don't go with millimeter for 22s. Yeah. It's caliber. So 22 caliber bounces right off of it. Not rifle shots. I'm talking just like regular pistol sure. shots. That's amazing. And then I wanted to, s it's funny how we tested this because I, you know, my dad used to work for customs. So he was, he was a gun guy. Nice. And I said to him, 
after we pulled the first one from the mold. And I'm like, I wonder if it's bulletproof. My dad pulls out his pocket gun from his back pocket. He's like, let's find out. Right. <laughs> We're going to find this out right so now. So we, we set up, a, a, we have a workshop, and it's like a big open vacant yard. So okay. we're working outside. So we set the, the shield up on the opposite end of this, like, 60-meter 60, uh, 60 yard. It's huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, like, on one side of the yard, we're on the other. We're hiding behind some pallets and some uh, barrel drums. <laughs> and we just, like, he takes a crack shot at it, bounces right off. And I'm like, okay, it didn't seem to ricochet too bad. So he gets closer. He fires the full clip at it. He's like, all right, it didn't break. That's good. Wow. So then he's like, I'm going to go get something bigger. So he goes and gets a, a 9 millimeter. He shoots it at it. Now, that did some damage. That, <laughs> that dented it, but it didn't go through. It dented it on yes. a 9 millimeter. Yeah. So 9 millimeter oh. will dent. So then he fired a few more shots, and the 6 shot broke it. So wow. after that, we were like, all right, 6 shots from a 9 and infinite from 22s, not rifles. Rifles, we're not sure what rifles will do. They might have a little bit more kick behind them. Yeah, so. I would say it'd probably go through. But if it can survive a 9 millimeter, it's most likely going to be fine. Sure. The only thing I'm worried about, because I do say when I make them, it's like, hey, they're bullet resistant. I don't say proof they're resistant. Because sure. proof is mean, hey, I can shoot it with anything. Yeah, like forever. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it was, it was definitely an interesting project. Because we went from building, you know, paper mache Daleks to bulletproof shields. Yeah. And after I learned not to mix iron with aluminum, <laughs> right. we just made straight up aluminum mixtures. Now the aluminum ones are a little bit weaker. Sure. They don't take as much resistance. They dent under the 22s. Okay. They also are still resistant to the nine millimeter, surprisingly, but they take less shots. They take about five, maybe four shots, and then they'll go through. Gotcha. So, yeah. But that's still pretty awesome. It's impressive because you know it's it's a it's, it's a, a bullet retardant shield. shield. Yeah. It, it won't. <laughs> It's not a, it's not gonna get shot by you know something and go straight through and you know you're gonna be like ah, so right. much for my prop Captain America shield I've been shot. Sure, and the fact that it's a prop that's practical that's insane. It is practical. It it's funny because the first person who ever bought one, um, not a particular fan favorite of his. Right. Guy's kind of a dick, but whatever. Right. That's that's my personal opinion. We had a conflict over a disagreement. He commissioned me for something, and. I personally felt like the commission was going to be too troublesome, right? Okay, yeah. I told him, find somebody else, and we had a big dispute over it. It's like, I'm not the only prop maker. Just go find somebody yeah, else. And that's your right to... He held it against me personally. He tried to you know, run a smear campaign against me and vindicted me across the internet. I'm like, all right, whatever. And eventually he apologized later. I still don't like him, but right, that's, yeah. that's, I, I have you. issues. so I don't blame you. <laughs> but he's the first person to get the shield. And uh, he used to run around with it. He would train with it because he was getting in shape. He was cosplaying Captain America, and he would get—he wanted to get in shape. Okay. And um, you know, he he would run around his block with like three miles with a shield strapped to his back. So that's 15 pounds worth of weight. You're running around. He'd lift it with one arm, then switch it over to the other and do arm ups with it. Right. So he, he used it as an exercise tool. It was funny to me right. at the <laughs> time, but you know, it's a—it's a definitely an interesting prop. What I'm learning to do now is I've learned how to cast anything in aluminum. Because wow, um, if you're familiar with EVA foam and how we yes. use peppercore to transition onto EVA, yes. you know that we can just basically print and then paste and then cut out the foam and make something out of that. Sure. Well, the way we can do that, I can take the foam, I put it in a sand mold, and as long as the circumference of the, the foam is not too big, I can cast that in aluminum. Sure. So let's say I had uh, an example, an Iron Man helmet. Right. I would cut that up into maybe five different pieces and cast each one individually. Gotcha. So then I have five different pieces of a whole helmet that was once foam that is now made out of aluminum. Gotcha, okay. Then I reassemble them in the aluminum form with either tack welding, which is a type of welding that you can weld anything with. Right. Because usually the way, the way welding works is it runs an electrical, electrical charge through most metals. And usually if the metal, metal is not magnetic, the electrical charge will not conduct properly. Right. There's also other issues. I forget the technical term, but there's also the rods. They don't like to work on specific metals. Right. Brass is one of the things that you almost always can't weld. There are brass welders, but they have their whole set of tools that are isolated for just that. Sure. And they can't, like, weld whole lines as well as we could with steel. Right. And then for aluminum... Same thing goes with that, but tack welding does aluminum. So okay, that I works. Can, yeah, I can. I made a. I've actually made my welder. I don't have money to go out and buy a tack welder, right. so I took apart two microwaves and I made a welder out of that. That and is insane. The only problem is it doesn't have an arc stabilization field, which is the frequency that causes the electrical current to run through the metal. Right. So without the stabilization for the the consistency of the current, 
I get blotches in my weld, so I don't weld for long periods of time with that for that right. reason. But the fact that I made it, it works, whatever, I get it to go. <laughs> I can, ta I can like, spot weld with that, and that makes it work. That is incredible. And uh, so, as I was saying, if I want to, I just cast it four separate pieces, reassemble it with a tack weld, and I now have a metal Iron Man helmet. And this is the best part. The, the foam is so thick, it's like quarter inch. Yeah. Quarter inch aluminum at that thickness has the same repellence of bullets as my Captain America shield. Oh, nice. So technically it's a bulletproof Iron Man helmet. That is amazing. The first test I did, because I was worried that EVA foam wouldn't work with the slagged aluminum. I thought the aluminum wouldn't be en hot enough to melt the EVA foam, because you're supposed to do this with styrofoam. Right. And styrofoam is not exactly my go-to material. I hear you. Not something I could really work with that easily. Right. But I wanted to see if EVA foam would work. And it's a, it's a heat retardant material. It's not going to burn easily. Right. So... And when it does, I thought it's very the, uh, <laughs> the metal would not slag it. It did. It has a resistance to it, but not enough to keep it from burning through. So nice. it works. That's and, awesome. Um, it, it's interesting because it opens up this world for me that I could theoretically make anything out of aluminum if I can make it out of peppercora. Sure. And I mean, peppercora is kind of, in a way, cheating because you didn't make the template, but it's hit and miss with that because they, sometimes you have to make the template because you get the peppercora and it's all wrong. Yeah, I have yeah. to redo all of this. I s still need to figure out peppercora. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Um, you just, you just, usually you have to find a person who's made the templates or you can try and make them yourself. Sure. The way it works is the program, there's a secondary one, not the one that, reader is a different one from the maker. Right. There's also designer. Okay. And both of those are used for uh, printing the paper templates. Right. And then the maker is used for scanning 3D objects and turning the polygons into a file that, which is a PDO file, right. which is what Peppercore uses. Okay. And it analyzes the polygon structure and it unfolds it into a flat piece of paper and says, this will fit here and reshape ah. into that based on the polygon structure of this 3D image. So if it exists in a 3D image, the computer will reverse analyze because technically all 3D animation is flat, just rounded off. Right. Because polygons are, you know, they're, they're flat little areas that are just made into shapes. So right. that's how it's able to reverse it and turn it into something that can be made flattened and undone. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple once you, once you figure out how to do that. I, I never really had the patience to do it. And then you have to unfold it. Because right. the computer's first attempt to unfold it, uh, it's not going to work for you. Gotcha. It will technically work. But you're going to be like, why would you do this? Right. <laughs> Who would sit here and do this no. madness? <laughs> so um, I made a huge mistake. <laughs> yeah, I did that with Clone Trooper armor once. Oh, nice. Because I didn't have any, so I did that process. And the Clone Trooper armor had so many cuts and folds. When I put it together in the foam, I'm looking at it. It looks like it was stitched together like some sort of Frankenstein armor. I'm like, nope, no. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. I gave it to my friend. He's like, oh, this is awesome. I'm like, yeah, I'll have fun with that. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> it, it, it's, on, it's on me. Have fun. He used it for a Jedi clone trooper armor, kind of like Obi-Wan Kenobi used his clone armor in the, oh, nice. the TV show. So he's like trying to do something like that. Right. But I was like, good don't luck. tell anybody I made that. Right. <laughs> he's like, oh, no, I'll tell my mate. He's like, okay, good. <laughs> but, it, I mean, it's fun. That's awesome. I, I like the challenge. Yeah, it's good. And once you mess up enough times, you learn how to do it right. That's pretty I'm much still messing my cosplay up. motto. <laughs> I, I, I like everything I do definitely has faults, but I'm learning how to do it better. Sure. So once That's I learn how to do, do it perfectly, I'll you know be able to make as many as I can. That is awesome. And I'll make new things. I'm actually going to attempt to my newest project yeah. I'm going to take on is a little ambitious because it's not a prop. Okay. It's a contraption. And okay. I usually steer away from contraptions because they lead to dangerous things. Yes. Because it involves me having to use them for something. Right, right. So, whereas a prop is just a showpiece. A contraption is used for practical assertion in modern day life. And I'm like, oh boy, right. here we go. <laughs> so when I tell you what I'm going to build, you're going to like, John, no, yeah. go to the car, John. Let's hear it. Uh, I'm going to build the uh, grappling hook from uh, the newest Assassin's Creed game. What? Okay, bear with me. <laughs> so there's a person who's already made one. Okay. And his was good. He's an engineering genius. But Makes sense. his is a bit bulky. I think it can be miniaturized. I think it can be compact and fit in my sleeve. I think it can be like the hidden blade because okay. his comes out off his arm almost a foot. Okay. And what it is is it's compressed CO2 air in a canister that he made. He, he built sense. the housing, 
So then the housing encompasses a tube. You put the grappling hook. It's like a it's like a pipe, and it has two prongs that come off the side. Okay. And it fits in the shaft. You, you, the CO2 pushes out at high speed. It uses nylon rope, which nylon rope's a good idea because you couldn't use cable. Cable would just tangle because of the way it r- rolls up. Sure. Uh, so you use nylon rope. Uh, it's it's good, I guess. Nylon rope's not bad, but it breaks after a while. Right. I would have used parachute cord because that's thinner. Sure. And it w- supports more weight. It's 800 pounds worth of you know, cord right there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, in my mind, that's the most practical thing. But it fits on a spindle. The spindle is kind of like the uh, the winding area that you put your bobbin on a sewing machine and it spins okay. it for you. Only it just free spins. So that way... The rope gets wrapped around it. It's on a cone-like shape. The cone faces towards where you're shooting. Right. So uh, that way the rope doesn't get tangled, tangled as yeah. it unravels going towards its destination. Gotcha. So, you know, this whole thing's strapped to his arm, and then he has a winch from a power drill wired to that spindle. So okay. then he sticks this rope. He's wearing a harness, a climbing harness. He, right. he straps it to his arm onto the, the contraption. He shoots it up to where he wants to go, and he starts winding himself up, and he'll ascend straight up into the air at a very slow pace. Sure. But he can still send up at least 20 feet worth of, uh, you know, climbing distance, which I was recently in a situation where I could have really used that. I was was going rock (laughs) climbing in Alabama, and I was like, God, I wish I had one of those there. Right. If only (laughs) uh, the amount of times I've wondered, I should have a grappling hook right now. (laughs) It's it's pretty cool. I think I can work on his – his sort of design and make one better. Sure, absolutely. So I'm going to attempt it, see if I can take a crack at that. You will because, definitely have Because, I mean, the one from Assassin's Creed is fast. You just go straight up like Spider-Man, and it's, like, invisible. That's yeah. not going to happen. No, but <laughs> that's a video game. <laughs> yeah, but you can make something that's still practical in real life that, you know, you, you never know. You're stuck somewhere. You're out on an adventure with your friends. All of a sudden, you, you're stuck in a 20-foot incline. It's like, oh, we're stuck here. What are we going to do? We can't get up. Yeah. Your friend pulls <laughs> up his, his, his jacket. He's got a... <laughs> A compact grappling hook is like, don't worry, guys. You're, all your friends are like, what the hell? Right. You, how all of a sudden, you're the that? coolest kid at the party. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, it's one of those things. I, I just want to have something that I can say I carry with me. It's like, oh, yeah, I have a grappling hook strapped to my arm. You have a what now? Yeah, what are you, Batman? Yes, actually. Yes, actually. I, <laughs> I, I have the qualifications of I've Batman. I got a bulletproof shield and a grappling hook. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wouldn't go that far. It's like, I'm prepared for a few things, but Batman, you know, yeah, right. every contingency plan known to man is there. <laughs> That's true. A, so, a, a, a proto Batman. <laughs> exactly. So I'll be the. Uh, the would-be Batman in training. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, awesome. it's, I like the idea of being able to build just about anything you can imagine. Sure. I feel like a lot of people look at it like it's science fiction. When right. in reality, it's not. It's just the practical assertion to make it real. Right. A lot of people lack that determination. Absolutely. It's not that they don't have the knowledge or the capability. I believe everybody is smart enough to do anything they want. Especially with the Internet. Exactly. We have access to all the information in the world. Yeah. Of course, we went and go and made it difficult for us to find what we want. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, let's make this thing it'll make everybody smart. No, 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 let's make it confusing. There we go. That's better. But That's um, anyways, I, I feel like anybody can do anything they want right. if they want to. It's just what you want to do. Agreed. Some people don't want to do the same thing. So they, they What are you willing to put the time in for? That too. And it's the determination. It's like, I want to build a grappling hook. A lot of people will go, oh, man, I could never think of doing that. It's like, it's not that you couldn't. It's just, you know, you got to want it. Right, absolutely. And if you don't, that's there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody wants different things. It's exactly. And that's what makes us people. I like that because there's diversity. Sure. But, you know, I, I feel like there's still this idea that a lot of this stuff is impractical or impossible, when in reality it's very close to our grasp. Absolutely. Especially with 3D printers, the Internet, as you have mentioned. Yep. All the different tools that we can commonly buy. Things that you didn't have access to back in the 40s. Or even in the 90s. Yeah, you know? so it's you know it's a different world. It's and an exciting time. It is. It's also, you know, it's, it's troubling time. Yes. There's injustice everywhere you look. Always but will be. there's a lot of good things happening at the same time that I think we need to focus on. Cause, I you know, there's completely agree. There's a lot of in-between. There's just there's good and bad with every side. Every decade have it, has yep. its injustice, and it has its good. So, I mean, this particular decade has not been good when it comes to a lot of people who are getting hurt true there's a lot of things going on but at the same time it's always been that way throughout human history we've had 
We'll we, get we'll through it. Exactly. It, it, it comes, it goes, it, it comes back again. It, it's For sure. Life, it's never going to be perfect. It's impossible. Exactly. If it was, I personally wouldn't want to live in it. I would right? be bored out of my mind. For sure. So, yeah, it's it's been fun. Yeah, it's it's very fun. Would you believe we're over an hour? I actually, uh, I would believe it. It feels like we've been talking for an eternity. Yeah. <laughs> which we I don't mind a lot that. Of but information. I dig it. No, thank you. So, where can people find you online? Uh, find me online at my Facebook fan page, which is called the Fourth Dimension Cosplay. Okay. Um, you want go over there and give me a like. If not, that's cool. I don't personally mind. I don't really right? pay attention to the page anymore. I do. I check up on it, make we'll sure I update it every now and then. But uh, if not, you can always find me at Major Props Cosplay, or sorry, not Cosplay, Prop Page. Okay. It's just called Major Props. And, and that's it where has a picture of Captain America shield on it. You can't miss it. And if you want to commission anything from me, go find me on that um, right there. So Sweet, man. Drop me a line. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you I for having me. I thoroughly appreciate it. I have enjoyed my time here. And that's it.